Welcome to our talks, everybody. Tonight we have Alexandra Hesse. Alex was born in Hamburg, Germany, and is currently the executive director of the Leonardo Museum. She has a Master of Business degree from the University of Sydney and a Master of Science degree from the University of Manson, Germany, where she was valedictorian. She also holds a certificate in art history and theory from the University of Sydney and a certificate, a certificate of professional designation in journalism from UCLA. Alex was awarded postgraduate scholarships from the International Olympic Academy in Olympia, Greece, and from the University of Mainz. Alex has been involved with two Olympic Games. She worked for the Sydney Olympic Organizing Committee and the Olympic Coordination Authority in Sydney, Australia, where she managed the publications and photo department and helped curate a 20,000 square foot exhibition. She also worked on the 2002 Winter Olympic Games in Salt Lake City, where she was a member of the Creative Services team. In Sydney, she served as manager of Stills Gallery, a multimedia art and contemporary photography gallery. Please welcome Alex Hesse. Um, space and print room 
Um, we open new shows every six weeks, so that was um, quite an uh, active schedule. Uh, we represent both emerging artists, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, how we selected them, and what we were looking for, and what the process looks like if, as artists, you're looking to be represented by a gallery, um, as well as some fairly established Australian artists, although I don't know that people here would necessarily be familiar with them. Um, all right, next slide. So what I want to do is just quickly show you a couple of artists that we represented. Um, Trent Park is actually, he's from Sydney. He's a documentary photographer for, first and foremost. And here we go. I don't know how to turn this off. Is anybody here able to turn off the slideshow thing by chance? Well, I don't know. I'll just have to keep stopping. Do you mean the automatic? Yeah, it's just going, yeah. I could try. Um, so Trent Park is um, a fairly young artist, or he was a fairly young artist. He's actually, he and his now wife um, came to Stills Gallery at some point with their portfolios, asking to be represented. They had no gallery to date, um, and Stills Gallery actually ended up taking them on and representing them. And Trent's work was interesting um, already, um, but within the span of the next three or so years after Stills started representing him, he was actually selected by Magnum. Do you guys are familiar with Magnum's photo agency um, created by a really famous French photographer back in the day? But um, they really are the creative. Which is a two minute of the Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. So um, it was really awesome to see how somebody who um, had started at that gallery was now represented by really the most impressive um, photo collective. It's a collective of photographers who um, you know, present each other's work. Um, so suddenly that made Trent a whole lot more collectible. But he has, um, as you can see, I mean, I just like this picture um, because it really shows you know, where he's from, namely Australia. But um, he's one of the, I think, stars that we represented. Somebody else that I just wanted to pull out just to show, you know, the breadth of the work. Molly Zeni Papa Petru, we always call her Polly. Um, no, it's still. It's good, yeah. Yeah, I'll just have to stop it. Um, she um, she does work really at the intersection of fiction and fact, and photography, of course, is an interesting medium for that. Uh, in the sense that it can be, when it comes to documentary photography, it can be very much about telling you know, truth, you know, conveying truth and a story. But then um, someone like Pauline Zeni um, really creates these very mythical, magical landscapes and puts creatures and stories into those landscapes that really um, leave people wondering, you know, about things. So she's somebody else who's, who was um, represented in this gallery. Ricky Maynard, again, I pulled him out because he's a straightforward um, documentary photographer who we represented. Um, and he is interesting in this interesting in the sense that he's an Aboriginal artist himself. And um, I don't know if, if you know about this, but a lot of Aboriginal um, people don't like being photographed at all. Um, but he really made it his mission to kind of capture the essence of his culture. And he um, created this beautiful series um, of just really larger than life portraits of these faces of Aboriginal elders, which in the gallery we would just kind of, we'd have these really large prints, you know, hung side by side, and it's just really haunting, beautiful, beautiful portraits that he's taken. So again, that's a much more documentary type um, artist. Um, Pat Rassington, again, she's, she's an artist from Tasmania. Who knows where Tasmania is or what it is? It's an island, so it's, a, it's an island south of Australia that, um, <laughs> that is very remote, so it's quite quite interesting to have somebody. Pat Rassington is actually one of the sort of more leading Australian artists when it comes to photo, media, art. Um, she creates, she uses photography, but then she strongly manipulates her images in Photoshop, so she alters them and then uh, prints them. Um, and her her work is very very kind of complex, has a lot of undertones of you know questioning sexuality, femininity, uh, things like that. Um, so her work is you know, very multi-layered. But, um, so again, I just wanted to pull out those four kinds of people. We, we had usually about 20 artists we represented in the gallery. So um, with that, just as a little kind of 
prelude to what I really wanted to talk about is in a commercial gallery, what was my role as a manager? Um, and we're going back. Um, so one thing was really, as a gallery manager or as a gallery, your responsibility is to select good artists. Um, and then of course, once they're on your roster, you promote them. Um, selecting artists, so how does that work? Has, have any of you approached galleries before? Any, any sort of end? Uh, the gallery I went to in the precinct, they said that like once a month, they had like three artists on the roster that would come, and then they had like a panel of judges, and that's what I say for that month. But I ended up coming down here and saying, so they like, so what I Okay, yeah. So there's very, and so there was another hand, somebody else had experience. Yeah. Oh yeah, your, your faculty, yeah. So, <laughs> what was your experience? Approaching a gallery or uh, lots of output, constant uh, feeding their their market. So yeah, you have to be very prolific. Yes, yes, actually, we'll come to that in a second. Um, so the way it worked for us, um, we had we didn't really have a policy as far as you know show up once a month and we'll have an official committee reviewing work. People could actually come and they did come and make appointments. Um, to say, can I show you my portfolio? I'm interested in being represented. Oftentimes, if they were smart, they would have come to a lot of our gallery openings before, or they would have made contact with us before, so that you know, ideally, they were sort of you know at least in our orbit before. Um, and then, more often than not, I mean, we would sit down with them um, and actually sit face to face and look at the portfolios. Um, and then, you know, how we decided. So this is a private commercial gallery, so we didn't, you know, have you know, a lot of boards or, or people that needed to be involved. So it was really, um, you know, it was really like a discussion maybe between the co-managers or the gallery owner just to see who we wanted to take on. Oftentimes we would do individual, if we liked somebody's work, we would say we'll do one show um, and then not guarantee that we're actually representing that artist, you know, for the long haul. But, you know, depending on how that went, we would then actually take them and represent them in our stable. Um, and I will say, I mean, I've, I've had people come with work that was really not ready or portfolios that were really not well put together or, um, or work that was pretty thin. So I don't know if any of you want to go at all and talk to a commercial gallery ever. I'm not saying you should, but if you do, it's a really good idea to, um, you know, just make sure you have the best possible um, you know, presentation of your work, um, have, you know, enough of a body of work that the gallery can really see what your, you know, what your work's all about. Um, and of course it needs to be good work. I mean, we've all, I, I don't know, or many, many in my shoes have also been in a situation where, where you look at work and you're like, yeah, no, that's just, you're wasting my time. So I'm sure that, that won't happen to you guys. But So the, the, <laughs> selecting the artist is kind of an interesting thing and it's also, um, hard sometimes to have to say no because people are really, you know, hopeful and, you know, they want to be represented and they come and, you know, show you their work and, you know, if it's not a good fit for the gallery, of course, our gallery also, we had this focus, you know, multimedia, contemporary art, contemporary photography, so if somebody was outside of those parameters, that also didn't make sense to us. So make sure you research also what the gallery's focus is. We also did art fairs and that was something that we started while I was um, at Stills Gallery. It's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. I mean, art fairs are this sort of like big circus where you know all the galleries go. And depending, there's Art Cologne, there's Art Basel, there's a lot of these European art fairs that a lot of galleries want to be at. They pay a lot of money to be at. Why? Because all the rich collectors come and buy a lot of stuff there. But also, you know, this is where you really get to show off the great artists you have. The, you know, the awesome work that they've maybe produced and this idea of prolific, you know, you always have to feed that machine too. You know. But um, it's interesting at art fairs too, you can really, um, you can see what other galleries are doing. You can see, you know, who's representing who, you know. It's, it's a really interesting, an interesting um, crazy couple of days, or I think it's a week sometimes, but, um, but it really allows you to see often what's going on internationally. Depending on where you, we, we used to go to Art Cologne, but also Paris Photo. So that was a an, um, an art show that was more an art fair that's really focused on photography. 
um, and then we did a, 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 an art fair in Melbourne as well. But it's really interesting. You, in, in, you know, in very few days, you just it's like a mad rush of creating, shipping, hanging, drinking lots of champagne for the <laughs> for the opening receptions, and ideally working networking with a lot of connector, uh, collectors and curators also who come to those events. Um, so that was also part of what we did at the at that gallery. Amy, I'm just curious, how did going to the art fairs change the nature of, your, of that gallery? It's a great question. So that that was what we thought would happen, and it and it, and it did. Um, it's it certainly led to us representing. So we represented um, at least one time a Dutch artist um, in Australia, and then an American artist. Although we found that interestingly, Australia was maybe a more um, a, a more insular market. So there wasn't really as much interest from the collectors in Australia to buy non-Australian art. Uh, but it's certainly like for the gallery staff and for our own sort of growth, um, it really changed, I think, our programming and it, it helped us kind of really be in touch with what's happening in, internationally. And I think as a gallery at that level, that was really important to us. But it's a great, that's a great question. Um, so working with collectors, that's something else that's really important as gallery staff. Um, so you all um, say you're all represented by a gallery, you produce work, your work's awesome. But it still won't sell unless the gallery actually does a lot of work in, you know, writing press releases, taking um, reporters to lunch to talk about your work and how great it is and the show that's up and coming. Um, calling up the collector saying, oh, you know, I, I know you love this kind of work and guess what, we have a new show coming out, you should really meet this new artist, um, I think you'll like his or her work a lot. Um, and really, like, it's an interesting, we, we talked about it before, it's an interesting ecosystem because some of the big some of the big collectors, if they buy your work, suddenly your stock rises as an artist. So suddenly everybody wants to buy your work too. Because if you have so-and-so's collection, you know, that's really meaningful. Um, so it's a it's an interesting um, again, ecosystem is the word I used before between collectors, museums, artists, galleries, media. Um, Working with cur curators in that same vein, um, the artists that we're representing um, will do the best we can um, to actually get in touch with um, museums, so contemporary art museums or whatever art museums, to actually make sure that if they're curating a show about any given topic that one of our artists might fit in, <laughs> that they include our artists in their shows. And again, if you're in a really well renowned museum and a, and a really amazing show, you will stock prizes as an artist. Um, likewise, museums, many museums will of course um, purchase works for their collections. So that's great too because not only have you sold the work, but suddenly your resume will say, you know, his work is held at MoMA, you know, collections and so forth. So again, when you have your next show and you're going to be setting your prices for the next show, all of this will allow you to just, you know, have a higher profile and make more money because it's a commercial, <laughs> it's a commercial cycle, this whole commercial world. Um, working with artists on exhibits, um, and I hear that you guys are curating exhibits here. You have a gallery space, which I saw, which is really very beautiful, I have to say. Um, so you'll know what that is like. <laughs> but so we'll have, again, we have uh, nine or ten shows a year. I mean, so we had two gallery spaces for a while, so there were even more shows than that. So the other side, of course, is to work with the artists on selecting, you know, selecting what should be hung in the shows, maybe what shouldn't be hung, you know, and then during the hang, there's a lot of negotiation between, you know, what goes where, this is too many, this is overhung, this is not overhung, and, you know, working on making sure it's lit and everything. Do you, as a larger gallery, do you guys do a lot of installation pieces? We did. I mean, installation mostly sort of video and media installations, not so much sort of, um, sort of installa other installation work. Yeah. But that's so what we had, like, the installation crew also was, we had a different crew come in for the installs, oftentimes when it was more media work or sort of installation or performance-based work that needed a different setting. So that, that was also really very much part of the, of the job. And then, of course, there's also the, you know, sending out invitation lists. I didn't, Sort of personally do that, but the gallery has a, a list of collectors and people who want to come to the opening. So 
Um, you know, you make sure that the opening is really well attended, that you get media there, um, that you get a right, great write-up in the paper the next day on the opening, and you know, a great image, you know, with it because images stick with people, and then everyone wants to buy that image. We always used to joke, you know, whichever image we um, we selected to go on the postcard, that was our sort of invitation to the to the um, openings. That's what everybody wanted to buy um, because we figured they had seen it before. You know, it's not necessarily. I don't know, but it was better than everything else in the show. But anyway, um, PR, of course, again, press releases about Trent Park was selected to, you know, join Magnum. You know, that's a press release. And press releases about openings. Um, public talks. We have students come in. We have general audiences come in. We have gallery talks. So that's all the sort of education and kind of promoting, promoting the kind of art that we were representing. And then also we, I put there, it's not, that wasn't really very time consuming, but it was interesting to keep an eye on the secondary market. Just to know what is selling, you know, at Christie's or at Sotheby's or at any of those secondary, at, the, at those auction houses, for how much, you know, because again, it doesn't influence, it didn't influence most of the people we had on, in our gallery, um, but some, actually, some some were old enough so that their works actually, and you know, high profile enough so that their works would show up in the secondary market. So again, if they achieved like a really nice auction price, that was nice to know. And again, something that we could then talk to people when they came to the gallery and you know, kind of talk about that artist more. So you see that it's a very interconnected world between you as the artists who make the work, the galleries who represent you. Um, and then the museums, the collectors, the media, and everything kind of feeds into each other. Um, what is the um, sort of involvement of the artists in all of this process? I mean, obviously they're making the work, but how much do they participate in the PR and talking and the interaction with the collectors and curators? Or is that primarily handled by galleries? I want to say a lot of it is handled by the galleries. Um, the, like we always bring artists to give art talks, you know, but not art, not all artists in our experience were really great public speakers. I mean, some were, some weren't, of course, right? So, so and likewise with the collectors, it's not everybody's cup of tea to go and sort of really be a salesperson, you know, call up people and say, hey, I think you'll really love this, and here's what I have. Um, so we do that front end, and then bring the artists in, you know, every collector wants to be the artist, absolutely, you know, and the artists are there at at opening, at the opening, and so forth, and for gallery talks. But I think a lot of the sort of the promotion and the relationship building with curators and so forth. That's that's why you want a gallery. They they do the dirty work for you. I mean, it's yeah. Is that there. Um, questions? Anything else on the commercial? Um, on the public talks, how do you choose who you bring in to speak? Who comes? It was mostly, so we would mostly bring, um, so sometimes we have group shows also, um, but usually if we had a show by a particular artist, we would bring the artist in and, and our curator. Um, sometimes we'd have uh, curators from the, from the museum come and talk about that artist, if that artist was well enough known by that curator. But so we didn't, we didn't re really bring in um, other artists who weren't represented. We do this at the Leonardo, so I'll talk about that in a second. Um, anybody else? Um, how do you decide if the artist is good? Like, what do you look for? What, what says this artist is good? What says this artist is bad? That's such a, it's a tough question. I talked to, we have somebody at the Leonardo who was also in the BYU show, Jen Hayworth, Allworth. Um, I don't know if you know her work, but she's you know, a very well-known artist. And she and I often say, there is good art and there is bad art, and there's an objective differentiation between the two. But then there's also so much that's subjective. So, so when I look at it from, so when I look at it from my commercial gallery side, um, it's it's more about how does it fit in in the stable of artists I'm representing, you know? So how does it kind of round out what I have? Um, I might have in the back of my mind also some of the collector's interests. Um, I'm definitely aware if this artist already comes to me and has had other shows or has had some kind of interesting. Um, other experiences, but I, I feel like that seems like a shooting star, when this is the rising star, so maybe I want to kind of invest in this person and kind of do all this work, because 
because I think this person will really go somewhere. There's some indicators that that's already happening. And other times it's really like, God, this is great, I love it. It's really good work. And again, I mean, I'm sure you guys talk about this, what is good art, you know? And it's all art, good art, and what is art? I don't know. I love this question. Just one quick question that's not been addressed yet. And when you say commercial, automatically think of commission. Um, and some galleries have a standard commission for everybody. Other galleries take certain commissions from artists depending on their popularity or their ability to sell. Can you, can you just talk a little bit about commissions? And well, we, yes, I know it's different, and I know it's also probably different in the States to Australia. I've not worked in a commercial gallery here, but um, we had a 60 40 split um, across the board. So, and with that money, so the 40% the to the gallery would allow the gallery to have the staff, have the space, hang the shows, and do all that. When it goes over the top of that, because uh, there, there's a lot of galleries now that are taking 60 and giving an artist 40. What's your, what's your opinion on that? Not cool. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you know, you still have to be, even as even as a commercial gallery, you should be in it because so you're passionate about it and you love it. And although there's sort of that commercial driver, um, and it's a bit of a game. I was trying to outline this whole thing. It's a bit of a kind of game that if you play it well, um, but you still should be in it to actually benefit the artists. So yeah, the, the you know the lower the cut can be, the, the lower it should be. But you still want to have like a you know you also want to invest enough in the gallery to. For it to be able to do what you want it to do, if that makes sense. And to have the relationships that you're actually wanting to, to forge with curators and collectors. And just one more follow-up question, sir. If the artist has set a price, then do, is the price for the consumer inflated on top of that price? Or do you work with the gallery or work with the artist to bring that price down a little bit for the consumer? Great, great. So we would actually set the prices jointly with the artist. So it was a discussion. We would sit we would sit down and say, okay, you've got a show coming up next May. Um, what do you think you're gonna make? And again, once you're on the uh, just to your earlier point, once you're in our on our roster, we want to show your work every so often. So you can just go, oh, just show the old stuff again, that's good enough. It's not. People want to see new work, you know. Um, so we would say there's a show coming up, what do you think, what are you working on? Do a studio visit. Let's just check check out what you're thinking. Um, and sometimes it's also funny because sometimes curators come back and I'm like, oh, I don't know, that seems pretty crazy to me. What she's working on right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, so and we don't tell artists what to do. I mean, that's another thing. We don't tell artists. You know what's really hot right now is I don't know digital photography. Do something like that. I mean, we really respect their own process and their work. Um, but then, but then we do sit down and say, "What's the opening date? How many works do you think you'll have? What do you think the price point is?" And oftentimes, I mean, it's very much based on, you know, where they where they've been before and less. So Trent's work, the minute he joined Magnum or he was purchased by all kinds of collections, you know, the work kind of goes up. And the other thing, of course, with photography that you guys are probably aware of is there's additions. So the, the more you've sold of certain works, you know, the sort of the fewer prints that are left, the, the higher the prices will go. But that's jointly set. So we've never had a problem with ours uh, about pricing. So so when I left, I left the gallery um, actually only because my now husband decided to move to Utah, and, and I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> live by the beach and it's nice here and we're moving across the globe to Utah. Okay, let's do that. Um, <laughs> so I didn't know and, and I didn't know what the gallery landscape was like here or the art landscape. And so coming here then I, I landed my first nonprofit job. It's a very different world. And in fact before I left Sydney I was like, okay, so there's a natural sort of incision when you kind of leave a place and you really pack up and leave. Um, what, what do I want to do? And I was like, I love working with artists. I love promoting art. I love, you know, that world. But having to sell, it makes it just kind of, it just paints it just a little bit for me. I wonder if there's a different way of doing this. I had no idea that nonprofits probably even existed other than, I don't know, 
I don't know, soup kitchens and things. Um, then I found Leonardo, and it is a 501c3, so it's a non not for profit, private non for profit. That, having listened to my bio earlier, you can imagine, appealed to me <laughs> because it fuses science, technology, art, in experiences for visitors that we want to create for them that really make them empowered to be creative and innovative people and minds in their own rights. So it's a really novel, it's on the one hand a really novel concept, on the other hand, we're called the Leonardo, I look back at what Leonardo the man did in the Renaissance, which was exactly what we're talking about, which is fuse disciplines, look, look kind of outside the box you're in, and, and there's lots of amazing things you can find, you know, when you kind of combine combine disciplines. So the Leonardo's mission is that, and it really appealed to me, um, you know, tremendously, just given my own uh, sort of broad background, um, and it's a not-for-profit. So, um, the Leonardo is a very complex um, institution, and I can talk about that for a long time, which you don't want me to, but, um, but I thought what I wanted to do is just talk about the, how the Leonardo, as a, as a non-profit museum, works with artists. And we do this in very different ways. So sometimes we will commission artists. In other words, we'll say, OK, we've raised some money. We're doing an exhibit. This is what we want to do. We found, either we know somebody <coughs> um, that we want to commission, or we'll have calls for submissions. Um, and then we'll say, this is, this is the kind of, you know, this is the topic we want to explore through art, um, and we want to commission artists. Um, sometimes we'll just borrow works um, and include them in a temporary exhibit, and then they get sent back. Public art, um, we only really have, well, we have a dark snow painting that was there since 19, that's been in that building since 1964, and then we also have a public art piece that the Leonardo Commission and ran. Um, I'll talk about that more. And then we have residencies as well. So I just wanted to kind of go through those. So Philip Beasley, he's um, <laughs> Philip Beasley is one of the people um, where it, it wasn't so much a commission; it was kind of a commission. Um, but Philip Beasley is um, a trained architect. He's Canadian. He then um, turned to art uh, and very sculptural art to um, further the the kind of investigation that he has in, in, in the kind of architectural realm. He's really interested in what he calls responsive environments, um, which is to say this idea of, you know, if, if I'm here and this is the building, I'm alive and the building doesn't know I'm here and it doesn't, it can't, it doesn't have a, there's not communication between me and the building. Is that really true? Is there more of a continuity of, of you know, even, um, energy is kind of a weird word to use, but um, so he's kind of asking that as one, a very practical question in terms of architecture, you know, but then as a very kind of philosophical question. His, um, then, so he started creating a series um, called Hylozoic Soil, Hylozoic Ground, in which he uses a lot of technology and science to actually create these environments, and the very, again, sculptural, interactive environments where people walk into the work and this is just a shot from, in our case, it's in an atrium space. This is a shot looking up. In other cases, in other installations, it's been um, a room that you can walk in. And he has motion sensors built into the work. Then he uses muscle wire and things like that. So there's, you'll see that um, the piece suddenly responds to your presence. So again, that's kind of, that's his investigation. That's his research question. What happens if there's an environment that knows you are there, that has like a rudimentary sense of, or rudimentary intelligence in the sense that throughout the work, that it's, you know, there's little, you know, all those pieces are connected. So the, the piece itself as a whole will at some point, you know, light up or do something as a response to all the stimuli it's been receiving. Uh, it has a primitive, what he calls breathing mechanism. There's little bubbles in the work that actually filter air. So he's a very interesting artist. Um, he was represented. So he was representing Canada at the Venice Biennale in uh, 2009 or something. I think nine or ten. Leonardo opened in 2011, and we were actually able to just commission and purchase the work that 
that was in Venice, um, and he redesigned it for us for the vertical atrium space, because in Venice, in, in the pavilion, in the Canadian pavilion, it was um, a, a horizontal piece. Um, it's made of 500,000 individually cut plastic pieces, and again, has all kinds of technology and, and nanotech and things like that built in. Um, but with a, an RDA grant, we were then able to purchase the book. So that's one way, uh, one artist we have, and of course, really very high profile. Somebody else we commissioned for opening was Amy Karen. So this was a straight out commission. We wanted to do an exhibit about energy and the future of energy. You know, like a discussion about what are the sources of energy in the future? Why should we even care about this? Um, um, so she, she was a local artist, and I don't know, do you guys know her work at all? She's from Utah. Um, but we said, uh, we wanted to talk about the algae because at USU there's a lot of research that's going on into algae as a source of energy in the future. So we said, just go, go research and make an installation piece that's very immersive and very kind of emotionally kind of transformative, ideally, um, that kind of talks about this topic. She came up with this piece called Holotype. Um, and I won't go into too much more detail, but in that case, we actually knew we wanted to work with her because um, we had seen that she had, uh, previous to the installation she did here, she had actually done a work called Waves of Mu, in which she worked, had worked with a neuroscientist on um, creating a, a performance piece and an installation piece about mirror neurons. So she'd, she'd already worked at this intersection of science and art. So that's why we actually approached her outright and said, we want you to do this piece. Um, Another, another um, example is the public art I mentioned before. That was 1% um, of our um, building and exhibit budget um, was earmarked actually for public art. And um, so we actually issued a national call, a call for submissions. We received, and we worked with the, with the Utah Arts Council, Salt Lake Arts Council on this. We actually received a really tremendous response, which was very cool to see that we, as a new museum in Utah, caught the eye of a lot of, you know, national artists. Um, we had a jury of, I believe, seven members. I don't know, Jeff Lamson. A lot of a lot of curators, uh, local curators, were on this jury. Um, and then we um, had a, a whole process of kind of going through all the all the um, applications, and then we had. A few finalists selected who then flew out to Salt Lake, presented the work, and then the jury decided which ones we wanted to commission. And the result is what we call the, this piece is called the Dynamic Performance of Nature, um, because it's an actual visualization tool, it's fiber optic cable embedded into, into all these bins. And all these cables are hooked up to a database that is actually monitoring weather um, patterns um, anywhere at all on the globe. So the image on the right, where somebody is actually tweeting, you can actually tweet to the art wall and say, and tweet a zip code for Hawaii or whatever, so the, the piece will then visualize the temperature. So red are warmer temperatures, blue are colder temperatures, and the way they move signifies the, the, the wind patterns. <laughs> so it's a very interesting, uh, kind of always alive piece. So that's uh, ultimately, that was a public art piece that we commissioned. Um, another example, so in the, in the spirit of like temporary shows that we, um, that we just bring in an artist for a few um, for a few weeks or months, as the case may be. Um, Paul Blackmore is actually one of the artists who I knew from my work at Stills Gallery, because we represented him for a while. Um, and we wanted to do a show uh, at Leonardo about water, and water is a resource into the future, um, and why people should start caring about water, and kind of maybe water cons conservation, and things like that. So Paul um, had to travel around the globe and shot these beautiful black and white images of water in all, all different aspects and all different um, uh, cultures um, and, and sort of looked at both the spiritual aspect of water, which in every single culture it has you know, baptism and cleansing and, and, and religious significance. Um, then um, sort of water as a leisure element because everyone loves frolicking around in water, but then also water as a global resource that's kind of shrinking, or at least clean water. And so we then built content on that, onto that, and, and wanted to have a discussion with our visitors about, you know, what, you know, how much clean water really is there, how much drinking water, there's not going to be any more, <laughs> what are we going to do to conserve it? So that was, so we had this work on show for a couple of months, and then it came down. Um, 
Michael Feltron, another sort of example, somebody we just um, had on display for a while. Um, he, we had a show about um, identity, so it was like asking the question of what makes you who you are, which when you think about it, that's a really complicated <laughs> question that nobody knows the answer to. So we had different, actually eight different art pieces and a science lab and everything in this exhibit. This I just wanted to highlight because I personally think it's very funny. This guy creates an annual report about himself. <laughs> it's called the Feltron Report and he does it every year. So he goes around, so he's I think in New York, um, he goes around and counts every he documents everything he does. So how many how many beers have I had? How many minutes have I been on the phone? How many hours have I sat in meetings? How, like everything. And then he makes pie charts and graphs and everything, and it looks really like a corporate financial report, but it's just about his life. So this question about identity, I loved this angle on it. Like if I counted everything in my life and I made pie charts and, and visualizations of all these pieces of information about me, would that give you guys a clue of who I am or not? So that was just one piece in our identity exhibit. Um, so this one's just in it for kicks. We also then have a, um, a, a residency space. It's called the Lab at Leo and it is actually run by Jan, who I've mentioned before. She um, is, again, a great artist in her own right. Um, so what we do there, and what, what we wanted to do as Leonardo was um, to make a commitment to, um, to um, really getting the general public exposed to real practicing artists, as opposed to museum educators or arts educators telling people what it is to make art. So we decided to say every month we'll have a small budget to actually have somebody be in this little residency space that is open to our visitors where artists can work on something, you know, they can work on a particular piece, but you know they might teach some workshops or classes or they might just be interrupted by people saying, what are you making? And wow, but you know, what is that? And, and the idea is really for for people unlike yourselves who are not really familiar with art and making and so the creative process, it's really it's really hard to jump in and say, I'll I don't know, I'll paint something or I'll draw something, but you know, a really an easier way for them to start connecting to sort of the, the artistic process is by talking to someone and seeing them work. And it's actually I think it's worked out really well because I think it's much more authentic that way, you know, and and I think people have very much enjoyed it. I kind of put some resident names on there and you know many of them might look familiar to you guys, but we've had very diverse people like violin maker, printmaker, painters, you know. Of, uh, different artists. It's um, quarter to seven, so I don't know if I want to open it up to questions or if you want me to talk about. I have this third part, which is sort of talking about art and science, the intersection of art and science. I don't know if that's a question. I just had a quick question about the residencies. Um, do the artists have time where the public is not allowed to interact, or are they just allowed to interact with the time they, they want? have done it really differently. I think because different artists have very different levels of comfort with sort of the public. So we sometimes we even put a little stanch in there and you know the artist is like in a zoo like don't be the artist but you know if you don't get so close you know. <laughs> because they wanted it that way, you know, other times other people are, love talking to the public and love kind of sharing their passion and I love that because they're invested in their own art or craft. And there is no better person to love to, to kind of talk to someone than the one who does it. So it's been very completely different formats. And are they uh, an experience where you have to apply for it, or is it something you go out and find an artist to come and do that? It's a bit of both. I mean, we have that. because we're so young as an institution, we haven't really formalized the process. <laughs> there isn't a jury and things like that. It's more like you email Jan, and if she likes you, great. You know, um, I think we'll we'll have to. Um, We'll have to probably get a little more formal about it. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, should I talk about art and science for, for a minute? Or yeah. Are you yeah, okay. Um, next slide. Should I even ask this? What is art? <laughs> Three answers, please. Anybody else? Creation. Yeah. No right or wrong. Understanding. Interesting. 
Perception. Perception, awesome. I love those. Um, and science. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. What else? <laughs> how things work. Okay, how? So there's an answer. So here's what I find interesting about this. Um, people think of art as expression, and you know some of the words on this slide, on this image, um, creative and open-ended and everything like that. They think of science very much of, as um, something that has one answer, and more importantly, the answer already exists. Um, so when we think of science, it's like, oh, I don't understand science because it's something I should know and there's an answer to it, and I probably don't know that. So it's a very closed and the engagement, I think. As a museum that focuses on art and science, it allows us to kind of be at this nexus. It allows us to use art for, because people are, in art, people are actually quite comfortable with ambiguity, open-endedness, interpretation, the asking of questions. Um, in science, they're like, well, just tell me how it works. You know, I just, I know there's an answer, so just tell me how it works. So, so it's interesting to maybe sort of think about the perceptions between the two, but yet, we've had some panel discussions between artists and scientists, and we'll do more programs around this. Some of the words you guys mentioned, it, both art and science about, are about process. They are about perception. They are about questions, right? And they are about then kind of making a statement and communication. So there's also, more often than not, you know, I think at least the process and, and also I think the place that both art and science come from is very similar. It comes from a place of curiosity, from a place of asking questions and wanting to investigate something. You know, um, if you go and say, you know, in Mexico, what are those big water holes called, they have a name that I keep reading. I was reading about that the other week. Um, they took some scientists, and these are incredibly deep caves, caves that have like ancient, ancient life way down, I don't know. So they've taken scientists, and they took water samples, and they did all kinds of science stuff, you know, and then they took some artists who also went and got to dive into those cenotes, is that maybe what they're called? I don't know. But, um, but so the question is like, does the scientist have the right answer to what this thing is, or does the artist have the right answer to what this thing is by making a, a video or a painting or you know anything else from it? So it's interesting, interesting maybe to ponder maybe the similarities and and also how how these two fields can, can enrich each other. So with that, like what we did. Um, Sort of successfully, we when we opened, when we first opened, we we did something called art. And they were actually called science installations. Science installations. The idea being that an installation is an art thing, and science is science. So I just kind of copied a, a little piece of our um, call for submissions. And again, for those of you who want to be artists, um, this is a great way to be included in museums. We we just issued on our website and through um, I think a press release. Uh, a call for submissions that was a much longer piece, but you know, we said, okay, we want to do some stuff that talks about, in this case, electronic circuitry. So show us the artist's vision for what electronic circuitry, da da da, could look, look like. And, you know, show us as an artist how you can delight in, in those topics that are science topics. Um, so we, we selected eight artists, and they ranged from people like Jeff Lieberman, who's a, I think, a pretty well known. Um, artists and roboticists actually at MIT to local folk as well. Um, so in that case, we didn't have tons of money for those, but we, I think there were eight grand per piece that we had, but, you know, so we had these sort of individual art installations that would then let visitors um, play with them, and one was about sound, and one was about, I can't remember. So that was one thing we did at the sort of art science intersection. We also brought in an exhibit called Think Art Act Science, which was, I think, a really amazing exhibit. It was actually curated by um, the Swiss um, consulate, basically, um, in San Francisco. But it came out of a, a residency program that they're running in Switzerland, where they're actually embedding artists for nine months in science labs. So that, but science labs, not like sort of, you know, sort of like little kind of I don't know, boring science labs. It's like CERN. And, you know, like really amazing places where cutting edge science happens. So they threw an artist into these labs, 
Um, and again, the artists had to kind of apply and be selected. And then they were actually also trained in sort of the, the discourse within that sort of scientific community so that they wouldn't just make a naive piece of art that, you know, this was maybe a piece of painting of what the lab looked like. And I don't know, I don't understand what they're doing in there. They wanted the artists to really understand sort of the topic, artificial intelligence, and, you know, all of those out there topics that the scientists were dealing with and give them enough time and actually encourage that discourse between the artists and the scientists. And then they created works. And they are all multimedia works, and I think all very beautiful works. Um, so we had we brought that exhibit to, to Salt Lake. It only played in San Francisco, Salt Lake, and then somewhere in Europe. So in my opinion, that was a really cool exhibit we had. Um, we also brought another exhibit called Nature's Toolbox that's using artists um, to talk about a topic that traditionally I think people might think of as a science topic. Um, so in this case, it was biodiversity. This question of you know why you know what what is biodiversity on the planet? Why should we care? You know, there's I mean only less than five percent of the biodiversity on this planet has even been classified. So there's so much we don't even know exists, and we also don't know how this web this web of biodiversity. You know, how are we all linked? How are we as humans, we're one species amongst many, many, how are we linked to everybody else? And what, you know, what damage can we do? Or what, you know, what, you know, what role do we play? So they, um, this is um, an exhibit that was curated by some uh, curators back east, played at the Field Museum in Chicago. This um, piece down, uh, the image that you see is all chopsticks. It, there was an installation of just chopsticks that talks about deforestation. It was just chopsticks people, <laughs> so you know. Apparently, they're they're accountable for like an amazing you know uh, rate of deforestation because they uh, there's so many uh, trees that are harvested to make chopsticks. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but that's just one funny piece um, from there. Um, um, oops. Okay. Um, so that was obviously the end of my slideshow. Um, but anyway, I think this, um, this, this art science discourse is, is one that's really interesting, and I don't know if any of you have any interest in, in working at this intersection, but in my, in my opinion, and of course I'm biased being uh, at the Leo, but in my opinion there's something very rich there, something you know, very fertile. If you bring sort of these, uh, if you bring people from different disciplines together, um, it really enriches probably both sides, you know, and as artists, I think the more you can get exposed to some of those, you know, uh, things out there, or discourse in other fields, you know, the more I think your own thinking will be deepened and enriched, and I, I think it really, um, you know, probably pushes everybody's practice, art practice, then to a different level, so I think it's something to maybe keep an eye on, personally, so, it is four minutes to seven, so, do you guys have questions for I became the executive director two years ago. I was the associate director for a couple years before then, and I was the exhibits director first. So I've been there for like seven years. I started the exhibits, cur like curating exhibits and, and creating content for the museum, and yeah, have become the administrator over the last few years. How does somebody go about giving um, their artwork to you guys? Like, how would you have us set up and portfolio to the shape? How would you do that? Um, we're, we're working on it. It's actually an interesting question because we're trying to work on sort of processes for these kinds of things right now. Um, we don't have, I don't have a specific answer. I mean, right now, I think I'd say find somebody's name on the website and, and email them. Usually it ends up in the actual program in the exhibits team's office, and we do keep a database of artists. So sometimes, again, the Leonardo exhibits, as you probably have seen, we, we like to curate exhibits uh, not as sort of traditional art museums do, but around a topic, like identity, what makes you you, or biodiversity, or water. So, you know, what we do is kind of build up a database of people's work, and if, you know, then there's a show that we want to do and we're like, oh, there's this person who does something and it would really fit with that. So send it our way. Um, I'll, I can leave some of my cards behind if you guys want to get in touch with my team, so. Um, do you do group shows a lot? Yeah, yeah. Most of them are group shows. We don't, 
we're not an art museum, so unlike Stills Gallery, so all of our exhibits are more, you know, they're more, again, there might be a science angle to it, and a couple of art pieces, but they're usually, uh, how would you have people organize their portfolio, like by topic or by style or by medium? For the Leo, for the Leonardo, or for a gallery? Um, both. Um, for the Leonardo, I'd like to see it by topic, but that's not what I would want to see in the gallery. That's why I'd probably want to see, like, if you have different series, like different bodies of work, I would just want to see the different bodies of work. Oh, um, interesting. So, you, oh, sorry, you're living uh, in a very different place, obviously, than seven years ago. How is the gallery experience here different than other places you've been uh, in terms of the commercial gallery side? I find it, um, I find it a lot less active. Um, so, I, um, in Sydney, it was pretty normal to on Saturdays to go out, grab breakfast, and hit a few galleries just for cakes and just know what's going on, not just people who work in galleries like myself, but so I think that there was very active, art was a more active part of people's lives and, and hence, you know, like media, so in the paper you would read about shows and, you know, there was more, it was more present. So I found it definitely, um, it's a much more, it's a quieter scene here. But I think it's changing as well. I hope it's changing. Any question about um, mm. Utah has got a great research and science medical community. Have you had much interaction with that community in Utah and artists in Utah? Is sure it's on the radar in terms of banking or on the radar in the media? The medical community, yes. Yeah, the research community. Yeah, the research community. So we're, uh, we've actually done uh, science, uh, like DNA uh, collections and things like that on the museum floor. So we've definitely worked, uh, reached out to that community. I was at some point interested in maybe creating a similar residency program that they do in Switzerland in Utah precisely because it has that kind of, especially the biotech sector is so big and active to maybe work with um, USTAR or, or some kind of groups like that to actually fund a program like the Swiss program and that might still happen, I just haven't had it But I think there's a lot there, actually a lot of technology and, and you know, cutting edge research that's happening. How did the some much better than others? I think so. Holotype, I showed that that work. Um, people were we had a lot of visitors who were like, "What do you want me to take?" I mean, it was just like, I don't know, what is this? Um, you know, I think we've really learned a lot. I think some galleries needed more explanation. Some 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 just needed some more content. Context. We actually talk a lot um, now. So we're now re, uh, redesigning a lot of our exhibits and re uh, planning for 2014. We talk a lot about needing to scaffold that's the word we use because people aren't used to some of the things we're doing. Um, and you kind of need to give them some explanation of where they are, what we're trying to do, what the topic is, so that they know what they're engaging with. Because otherwise, you just you just leave them hanging too much. So I think that was just like us not communicating by the right way. And people, a lot of, we had a lot of people at opening who came and said, this is really cool. And then they couldn't articulate why or what it was. Um, so we, we, we liked that they thought it was cool, <laughs> but we didn't like that they couldn't say what it was or why they should care. So we're, you know, I think we're learning a lot in terms of what we're next year we'll, we'll be quite different from what we were doing this year. But any of you have not been up, I invite you all to come to the Leo. Uh, if, I, you know, if I'm around, ask for me, I'll be happy to say hi and give you a little tour. Um, if you make it for the Dead Sea Scrolls, it should be pretty exciting. It opens next Friday.